At this time, I'd like to call into session the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee open meeting of Wednesday, May 16, 2018. Uh, the first item we have on our agenda is election of officers, but before we do that, I'd like to welcome our newest member, Kathleen Howland, who will be the Northboro, one of the five representatives from Northboro on the Regional School Committee. Congratulations. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, per our policy that we have on the election of officers, uh, it's rotated between the towns of Northboro and Southboro. This year it is the Northboro uh, turn to chair the North, uh, the chairperson, vice chair, and secretary. And I have the honor of uh, doing just the beginning of the election of officers as being the most senior member of both towns. And uh, so at this time, and anyone can make a nomination, and anyone, <coughs> all members will be voting on uh, the slate of officers. So at this time, do I have a nomination for chairperson of a Northboro member for the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee? Jack. Madam Interim Chair, uh, I'd like to <laughs> nominate Lynn Winter for Sorry. our chair. And second by Paul. Um, Lynn, do you accept the nomination? I do. Good job. Okay. Uh, are there any other nominations? All those in favor of the nomination of Lynn Winter as the chairperson for the Northboro Regional School Committee. And it passes unanimous. Congratulations, Lynn. Okay. So I take up the remaining uh, election of the remaining officers. Um, so we're looking for nominations for the office of vice chair. Madam Chair, I nominate Joan Frank for okay. the Office of Vice Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Motion by Tom Payne, seconded by Paul Butka. Okay, any other nominations? Seeing none. Um, so we shall off vote for um, Vice Chair for Joan Frank. All those in favor? Unanimous. That's unanimous. And the final office is the Secretary. Um, Nomination? I'd like Joan? to nominate uh, Jack Kane as secretary for the region. Second. Nominated by John Frank, seconded by <laughs> Paul Butker. <laughs> Any other nominations? <laughs> <laughs> no nominations? All those in favor? Okay, so we have our slate of officers. Um, the next item on the agenda is our public hearing on school choice. Every year um, at this time, we typically take up this uh, and have this public hearing. Uh, a district, school districts must, the school committees must vote to um, not participate in, in school choice. Otherwise, if there's no vote taken, it, it um, defaults to that you would be a district of choice. So right now is a public hearing, and later on we will have um, discussion and vote on it. So, yes? Um, it's tradition that I go through this okay. uh, language a little bit, so um, I think we've gone through half of it, but I'll just highlight it again just for um, audience sharing. Um, as Madam Chair Winter mentioned, it is typical in the month of May that we consider school choices an option, um, and it typically begins with a public hearing. The chairperson will welcome any discussion on this topic and will close the public hearing. A vote will be taken during the regular meeting agenda. Um, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 76, Section 12B requires that each year school committees consider whether their district should be in the school choice program during the upcoming school year. If they choose not to accept school choice pupils from other districts, they must take a vote prior to June 1, and this vote is required to be reported uh, by that date, which is just around the corner. If we do not vote by June 1, 2018, we automatically become a school choice district. The vote is recorded and forwarded to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Historically, Northboro Southboro Regional School District has not been a participant in school choice, and it is my recommendation to the Northboro School Committee once again this year that we do not choose to participate in the FY 2019 school year. My recommendation is based on the following. The current fluctuations of class enrollments during the school year, each and every fall, we have an outstanding report from the um, building administration as to enrollments in our classes, and each and every year we have a conversation about access uh, for all students who are currently enrolled in certain electives and definitely our advanced placement classes. And those numbers um, oftentimes are higher than we would like to see. And this, in fact, um, would have an impact, I think, on those enrollment numbers. 
Also, um, the impact on enrollments in successive years. Students who are enrolled at any grade level are entitled to remain in the district until graduation. Both uh, K-8 Southboro and K-8 Northboro have elected not to participate in school choice. So of the, of the region, we would be the, um, the only school. The $5,000 reimbursement uh, per child, which we would receive, um, is significantly lower than our per pupil expenditure of approximately $16,000. And many neighboring districts, in fact, are not identified as school choice districts and have chosen not to participate in the program. And I do know we'll be taking a vote for consideration later. Okay. And uh, so I didn't see any comments by the public. So I will call, uh, close this uh, public hearing on school choice. The next item we have on the agenda is the action on the minutes of the open meeting. So I move that we approve the minutes of the uh, the open meeting of April 25th, 2018. Second. Moved by Paul Bucca, second by Joan Frank. Um, any any changes or discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Uh, opposed? And it's abstaining, two abstentions. Abstaining. All right. The next is the action on the minutes of the audit subcommittee meeting of May eighth, twenty eighteen. Paul. So again, I would move that we uh, accept and approve the audit subcommittee uh, minutes as, as published from the Tuesday, May eighth meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Joan Frank. Uh, all those in favor? Oppose? Abstentions? One abstention? <laughs> okay. Um, and, okay, so next on the agenda is the educational policy. Um, we have the approval of the best buddies, student leaders, and advisors overnight trip um, to the International uh, Leadership Conference in Indiana University. Um, in Bloomington, Indiana, on July 20th through the 23rd, 2018. Paul? So moving right along, I move that we uh, approve the student travel uh, request for the Best Buddies trip as submitted. Uh, moved by Paul. Do I have a second? Second by John, uh, John Kane. Uh, any uh, discussion? Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimously approved. Okay. The next is new business. Um, so we have the science department presentation. Yeah. This rounds out, I think, the last presentation of this school year. It's always exciting to have our departments okay, present. My last round. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> you have many, more, <laughs> many, many more presentations. I, don't know about that, but I do have a few more. Absolutely. So, I'm just going to go yeah, this side. Good evening, Superintendent Johnson, Mr. Martineau, members of the school committee, and Dr. Walsh. Thank you for having us here this evening. I'm thrilled to be able to be present with um, future budding scientist and a teacher in our department, uh, Mr. Welty, to share some of the highlights that's been going on throughout the year. Before I give this stage to the students, which are probably much more exciting than myself, I have to first recognize my very passionate teachers. Um, these students wouldn't be where they're at today if it weren't for the endless hours, the dedication that my teachers bring to the classroom every day. They inspire these, these kids to go on. They make science come alive. Um, as I've said before in my presentations, I'm like the proud mother. Um, I couldn't ask to work with a better group of teachers. So I first thank you and the rest of the, the group. Um, as kids come in in the fall, they start in their biology, um, in their freshman year in biology, the first task that we have in the department is to get the kids to be, um, to pass the biology MCAS. Our kids are very successful. Um, that's done with a lot of hard work from the biology teachers to ensure that the curriculum matches what the test is going to be. Um, they do a lot of extra work on the outside, preparing the kids. Starting in May, they have extra help sessions after school. So our kids are successful, and we're very proud of that. Um, beyond that, um, they certainly go on. They take the chem, the physics. But our proudest moments are the electives that we offer. 
We offer six, on an average of six sections of AP courses. Um, that was between the year 2010 and 18. So based on what our needs are, so that would be AP Bio, Chem, Physics, and Environmental. Some have two sections, some have one, depending on what the enrollment is. Um, what's really flourished is our Forensic Science course. Back in 2014-15, we had four sections under the um, teacher of Susan Vaughn, she has inspired those kids and now we're up to eight sections. So our electives, you know, change in numbers based on the student um, desire. So you can see we have many different electives. I think one of the ones that's always interesting is the uh, organic chemistry. Many schools don't have organic chemistry, so we've been fortunate enough to offer that. Also, the science innovations is another class that's not offered in many schools and that's under the um, direction of Mr. Welty. So our kids have opportunities, and if they have desires and they come to a teacher, we're certainly willing to bring it to the table. Um, beyond the classroom, at the 2 o'clock bell, it doesn't end for our teachers. Many of my teachers are involved in extracurricular activities, coaching, advising, chaperoning, participating on committees. So this is just a little chart of what my teachers do. Every single teacher in the department is involved in at least one, two, maybe even three of those activities up there. So they're constantly making the connection. On May 21st, we'll have our eighth annual Science Career Day where we ho host several parents that come in and share their career paths in the fields of science. So they'll be speaking to our physics students this year. Um, it's very difficult to bring the excitement of our labs um, to you, so would really like to have you upstairs in the labs, but that just doesn't work. So we've thrown in a few pictures of students in the biology class modeling protein synthesis and natural selection, constantly hands-on chemistry students. Um, here she's making a hot air balloon, launched the hot air balloon to show our gas laws. Over here, back around the holiday time, they were doing a redox reaction, making holiday ornaments that also included stoichiometry. And then back in October, the Wicked Witches of D200 <laughs> put on many, many um, chemical reactions that we actually make connections to throughout the year. So that's kind of the starting to get the kids a little bit excited about chemistry. The environmental science, both at the AP and the elective courses, are um, exploring timely topics. Uh, that's Ms. Mott in the frog outfit and Ms. Mott, <laughs> both um, passionate environmentalists. So they are exploring global climate change, <coughs> alternative energies, fossil fuels, human population, and they go on. Anything that's current, they're bringing it to the table. So physics, now's the time for the kids. So I'm gonna introduce to you Katrina Liu and Mr. Welty, and they're going to give a little presentation on what's happening in our physics department. So one of the really cool things we did earlier this year was um, create our own bumper uh, with a partner, and every single physics class did this. And the point of the bumper, the point of the project was to design a bumper to provide the impulse to a car to change the car's momentum and bring it down to zero. So like in a regular car, using a bumper and trying to minimize the force of the impact. So as the, bump, the bumper creates an increase in time, which then um, lowers the force of the collision. And the only materials we had were three sheets of paper and that tape you see in the front. So we had to be really innovative. And uh, so part of the project, we took slow motion videos. Okay, right, like right here. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. And um, my design is actually on the left. And um, so that was the first step. And then we made the bumper, which is in the center, and then tested it. And we used an app called uh, Graphical Analysis, Analysis from Mernier. And um, on that app, it had the force, the amount of Newtons. And then we used the videos and the um, grab and the app to go back and try to make the bumper again to improve our results. So that was really cool. And that's Katrina's design right there as well uh, that you see. 
Uh, let's see. How do we go next? How do you? back all right uh, we just want to share some activities that the science the physics teachers are working on currently uh, right now we're talking about waves in all of our classes and you can see the lower left picture uh, students observing the diffraction of water waves through our, our ripple tanks um, also in the upper right uh, students in the hallway making standing waves on a slinky I believe that is second order standing wave right there uh, and then we also looked into uh, we have wave machines that, that we pre-purchase, um, but we figured out these were a little more fun um, in making a wave machine out of, uh, so that's duct tape through the center, skewers, and Sour Patch Kids on the ends of those. Uh, and you actually participated in that and made one of those. Uh, so they made their skewers, we brought them up and taped those, and that works great to show transverse waves, uh, different wave behaviors as reflection and refraction as well. So uh, always trying to find something in, in, innovative and new to do. Um, to just keep it fun. Great. Thank you, physics crew. All right, let's see if we can. Oh, boy. Well, back to the standard. <laughs> All right, next up is Jack Jankovich, who's part of the um, Science Olympiad team, and he is the team designer. Yeah. Is that good? Yes. Okay. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Jankovic. I'm a senior here at Algonquin. I'm a part of the Science Olympiad Club, which is advised by Mr. Largest and Mr. Wadman, you see on the right and left. So Science Olympiad Club is basically a competitive club that combines aspects of science, um, like engineering, biology, physics, and chemistry into one competitive club. So um, in Science Olympiad, what happens is you get a list of requirements and a uh, design that you have to create by the end of the year. And that's headed up by the Science Olympiad organization, which is a national organization uh, that gives those requirements to every school in the nation that has Science Olympiad. And we have to, we're in charge of designing. Us, the kids, are in charge of designing um, and per, refect, um, perfecting that to um, <clears throat> designing and perfecting those designs so when we get to a competition, we can perform the best in place um, nationally. So this year we went to two competitions. One was at uh, MIT in Boston and one was at Framingham State. Uh, I was in charge of designing a helicopter, rubber band, rubber band helicopter for uh, a competition um, at MIT. Our MIT competition is really used to refine our designs, work out any kinks the designs might have, and then the FSU competition at Framingham State is the uh, the state competition and that's when you're ranked in your state so this year our helicopter was ranked eighth in the state which I'm proud to say which mm. it took a lot of work uh, a lot of refinement in uh, designing something like that it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and uh, I just I owe it to the science department for all the education and all of the uh, the inspiration they've given me throughout my four years here Next, we have representation from the Wise Women in Science and Engineering, and we have Ariana and Dua. Thank you. Hi. So we're juniors at Algonquin, and we're a part of Wise, and our main goal is to inspire women to pursue science, engineering, STEM, science, engineering, technology, and math. So we have speakers come to our meetings, uh, usually women in STEM, to talk to us and to inspire some of our members. And we also do a lot of outreach, so uh, working with schools and girls in the community. And we're currently trying to work with Trotter Middle School, the girls in their robotics club, um, and we're gonna work with them uh, and show them how to use circuit boards. And we're going to go through with a game. We're gonna help them build them, and then they're gonna play a little game with the little lights that they just made. We're going to teach them about circuits and electrostatics, which is the fundamentals of electrical engineering. Yeah. Wow, that's good. Thank you. Our next group is our science research club, 
And I have Alex Chen and Andrew Gao that will share some of their. Thank you. So uh, I'm Alex. And, uh, I'm Andrew. Yeah, so uh, we're both uh, seniors here at Algonquin. And uh, we founded this club uh, two years ago. So it's a very new club relative uh, to some of these other clubs. Uh, so I was very, very fortunate to have had the experience of uh, studying carbon nanotubes at Northeastern University and doing research on that under uh, Professor Carol Livermore. And uh, I, we really uh, got together and then thought that uh, it'd be good if uh, Algonquin here had uh, a club where students could explore uh, less structured research and experimentation as far as uh, in the science field. Uh, the classroom and uh, the teachers do a great job in the classroom of uh, structuring labs so that students can explore uh, fundamental concepts, but it's really been great to uh, be less structured and be more flexible in our approach to uh, really looking into uh, topics of interest uh, for our students. And so uh, we're really fortunate to have uh, Mr. Cushing, who's an incredible advisor. Uh, he comes to school super early every single morning and stays after really late, and he even accommodates us uh, while he's coaching uh, boys tennis, which is uh, this spring season. So uh, he's been a fantastic advisor for us. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, two of our big biggest projects over the course of our two years. And so uh, this is our first one. So this was last year uh, conducting solar panel research. Uh, with all of the environmental sustainability issues uh, that the world is currently facing, we thought this would be very appropriate to look into. And so we uh, created our own device using an Arduino board and a breadboard to uh, sense the light intensity coming uh, onto the roof of the school. And then, uh, working with our school's uh, janitorial f uh, faculty, uh, we really were able to uh, uh, get a hands-on approach to researching uh, just how much uh, energy would be produced by a potential solar panel installation. Unfortunately, we found that uh, over the course of leaving this sensor on the roof and recording data that uh, given the cost of uh, likely in uh, replacing the roof and uh, conducting maintenance on the roof in the near future, it really wouldn't be that economically feasible at currently to install solar panels onto our roof. So uh, that would definitely be something to look into in the future. But uh, yeah, I know. I, we also talked, and uh, they did say they had a consulting service that came in to do similar things. So yeah. yeah it, it was, call you back from college to come yeah, in with this project, Alex. Absolutely. So it, it was great to work with, uh, with the school, and also great to have the kids explore uh, this interesting topic. And for our other big projects, this is more recent. Um, it was also uh, an environmental-based project. Um, so we were contacted by a, um, somebody who worked at Encyclopedia of Life. And they were doing a challenge called City Nature Challenge. And this was basically um, going around the um, Boston area and finding certain species and logging them in their app um, to be used at research facilities at like Brandeis University, UMass Boston, and um, some MIT labs. Um, so this was from April 27th to 30th. And we chose this nice, beautiful Saturday. And our species that we were logging were common dandelions. Um, not the most exciting thing, but <laughs> um, yeah, we did, yeah, we did run into some snakes. That was pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we logged that and um, the goal for that was to be used, as I said, for research um, on biodiversity and potentially just the uh, health of our environment. That's kind of it. Our next club is the B Club. Oh, what's? Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Is our B club, and the B president is Elsa Ray. Hi, everyone. I'm Elsa. I'm a junior. Some of you probably recognize me. I was here last month to talk about the Writing Center. Well, today I'm here to talk about the Beekeeping Club. Um, this is a club that I founded in my the fall of my sophomore year with the help of our very own Miss Sanini. Um, I was inspired to start this club because I am a beekeeper myself at home, and I fell in love with it and thought why not share this with the Algonquin community? It seems like it would be a very positive thing to have. So from that idea um, came the Beekeeping Club. We are a pretty small club, but a lot of our members are very, very dedicated. And over the years, um, 
we have had some great opportunities such as having a master beekeeper from the Worcester County Beekeeping Association come to talk to us. We've attended a lecture from a WPI professor studying pollinators um, with the Science National Honor Society. Um, and now we are fortunate enough with help from the Corridor 9 Scholastic Grant to, they gave us um, the money we needed to purchase a beehive, as you see in these pictures. Um, for Algonquin, and now on um, that it is spring 2018, we have a real functioning beehive on the Algonquin campus. It is in the Serenity Garden, and um, it is still fairly new. We started it in April with another donation from of bees from the Worcester County Beekeeping Association. And from that, we are hoping to, sorry, <laughs> in the future, to maybe um, engage in some research opportunities to work with, again, the Worcester County Beekeeping Association. and. Um, also the horticulture classes who are learning about importance of pollinators and farming and all that. So we're hoping to really take that far. Um, and I know, I know that a lot of people are a little squeamish about bees. Um, and that's, again, it's one of our goals in the Algonquin community is to kind of end the stigma that uh, is around bees and beekeeping and to educate students and the community about the importance of pollinators and beekeeping in the communities. So that's a little rundown of what we do and I think our club is going to do great things in the future. So thank you. There's another slide. Okay. No, I don't think that was, <laughs> okay. that was the only one that I did for days. Great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, the last club is HOSA. Um, I don't think I have any representation, but I want to first thank our student yeah. scientists for taking time out of their night tonight to give our... has become a pretty large group this year. Um, we have 40 students, um, and this club actually has a three-pronged mission. Their mission is to have community and school involvement and outreach, service and fundraising, and competition. Um, so back in, I think it was April, the group of students, 40 students, went off to Worcester State University, and during that day, they were involved in um, many competitions. They brought back many um, pieces of hardware, as as they stated here. Um, but they were in competitions. They had presentations from professionals. They were able to um, participate, as you can see here. So they had some competitions. They had some hands-on stations. Okay. This is like the story of my life with technology. <laughs> okay, but I think the most important thing that they did this year was their um, heart chase day. So what they did was they had a um, an event that they planned and presented to about 125 students. That was an interactive day to educate them on the health of the heart. So they had this in the gym. They had stations where kids could go to participate in um, stress management, um, exercise, cardiovascular awareness, diet, um, but they were all hands-on stations. So a big part of their club is to educate, and I think that certainly was, they did a great job this year in presenting to the students here at Algonquin. And I think that might be my last slide. So, any questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, could you describe what the Science Innovations class course is? Well, Mr. Welty is here, so I'm going to hand <laughs> over. <laughs> so he can give it air time. It sounds fascinating. Mm. Yeah, Science Innovation, this is the second year of that course. And um, it's kind of just extending off what they talked about with Science Research Club. Uh, it's an opportunity for students. Um, to be able to walk into that class and choose what they want to learn about. So the curriculum there is student driven. So I've had a class of about 20 students come in and each student is doing a different project. Um, so one girl this year, Ava, did um, a project on beach conservation and she actually did outreach to Wells, Maine where she summer vacations there. Uh, there when she contacted the town she found the names of some people that attended our conference there about beach uh, conservation. And she corresponded with a woman in New Zealand that was a graduate student um, and comparing that beach in New Zealand to the beaches in Maine. So that's really my goal of that class is that students get out of the four walls of Algonquin 
and make connections um, outside, you know, with people that are professionals in the field and, and learn from that. So. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Zani and Mr. Wally, I'd like to thank you and the student scientists for giving your time and your busy schedule to come and present and educate us on what is going on in the science classes. And it's wonderful to hear about all the outgrowth, the, the new club that came up, the Science Research Club, that came from interest, and it seems a wonderful group to start with that initiative and to get the interest from the students to do it. Um, and even the Beat Club and getting funding. I mean, as we look at it and we talk about our budgets many times, you know, I, we always hear about the wonderful uh, awarding of grants and that, and it's nice to hear about the coordinator nine uh, that gave it to it and also the, the other funding sources that they had. The one question I had about the whys was they, the two wonderful uh, ladies mentioned about they were going to Trottier. Will they be going to Malacan sometime? I would assume so. Um, I, I can certainly make sure that they're going to both towns. Mm -hmm. um, it's new this year. So I think it's just getting going. Mm -hmm. So I'll encourage them to get to both schools. Yeah. It's important. I mean, because I think it's wonderful. We always talked about when the high school kids go down to the eighth grades and talk about, you know, eighth grade coming up to ninth grade about the sports and all the clubs and everything like yeah. that. That's wonderful for them to go down and be the mentors right. and to get girls or anyone else, at, you know, uh, interested in the science field and to see what the rich program we have up here at Algonquin. So my hands yep. off to the faculty and your other faculty members and also the student scientists that are here tonight. They're great. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, just come up. Thanks very much. For yeah, you're welcome. It's terrific as it always is. You know, just from a budget point of view and stuff, I, uh, I always ask. I know. I'm uh, ready for you. <laughs> you know, are, are we turning away kids who want to enroll in science classes because we don't have enough faculty? and uh, Or is there any other... And the significant equipment that you know first of all I think we are weekend. we are very well supported as I've always said our budget is you know we do what we can with the budget um, you'd always want more right no, I yeah. mean I'd be crazy not to say you want more are we turning away I, kids are we turning away kids I don't think we're them? turning away kids right now no because what I see happening in our elective courses is sometimes is that high interest as we see in the forensic science next year but maybe a de uh, decline in the biotechnology. I think we are really circulating around based on the interest and balancing the best we can. Um, I mean, sure, we could probably offer more sections, but then you'd have low numbers. And would that be economical to run a class at 12? I don't think so. Okay. So I, I you know, I also look at it from a budget being positive Thank on the budget. You, you know, I'm not going to run a course that's nine or ten kids. It's just not not economical. I don't know if I'm saying the right thing or not. <laughs> That's how I run my household, you know? <laughs> Any other? Um, well, I'd like um, to thank you also for coming. And I really enjoyed um, bringing in the clubs, like, because oftentimes we see what's going on in the classroom, the different curriculum. But I like to focus on, you know, the different clubs that are related to the sciences and where those are very you know, pretty much all student driven in the initiative of, you know, applying what they've learned in the classroom into their clubs that they choose or even, you know, the inquiry that the classroom has inspired in them um, to to make a club and or to do a project within a club that um, that's that's what science is all about, right? In it inquiry. is. <laughs> we have a lot of good teachers that spend a lot of time with these kids. And as someone mentioned, Mr. Cushing is here early. I would say at least half of my department is here before 6 o'clock and here late at night. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. We light this side of the building up. <laughs> believe me. Yeah. I can attest to that because they would like me to make the snow calls at four o'clock because they've already they've already <laughs> left their house. Not doing that yet for us, but that's okay. <laughs> yes, I'm trying. So. We appreciate everything that you give to us. You know, we we've had nothing but great support in all the years that I've been here, and that's a lot. I just would like to add, you know, STEM is the latest acronym for science, but as you listen to the presentation, science integrated with technology, engineering, and math has been alive in our science department before the acronym was um, made popular. And uh, you can see that through not only the coursework and the courses that are 
offered to our students, but just the enthusiasm for each of the clubs and, and just the entrepreneurial, innovative spirit that exists in this department. Um, if there's a wish, there's a club. And um, you know they rise to the occasion, and our teachers do time and time again in the science department. So just always exciting to hear your presentation and to really experience what's new and innovative in, in the sciences. And Alex and Andrew, please don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> We're still not sure about the feasibility of the solar, but we will use your research to assist us in the, um, in the completion of that analysis. You can keep you from graduating, though. She keeps yes. out that diploma. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait, <laughs> Good? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next, next item on the agenda is a legislative update. I do. I actually do. I actually share this time uh, often with Mr. Desmond, but um, in your packets or beneath your packets is the latest release from the Senate Ways and Means Committee. While our budget is approved, the conversations still continue, and at the regional level, we often know that in August or September, we're taking yet another um, assessment <coughs> adjustment vote based on what the governor and um, all those at the State House uh, continue to do and work on up to and sometimes past July 1. So this is just the latest update, but there is some good news, particularly for the regional um, school district. I also have a letter prepared um, for the regional district to consider signing that um, in, would increase regional transportation reimbursement into the 85% range. This was an amendment. Um, we learned of it at the Mars board last week, and they said that you know, this was going to be forthcoming. It's an amendment to a bill that's already um, un, in consideration or under consideration in the Senate. It's an amendment to bill number 242 in support of the regional transportation reimbursement increase presented by Senator Gobi and Senator Sear. And this will be moving uh, pretty quickly along. They think they're going to be taking this up uh, for consideration next week, probably around May 21st. So um, everyone, all of the regional districts, certainly um, are being asked to consider this and to sign on in support of this amendment. So I do have a letter prepared, um, should the committee want to also take that position to Senator um, Eldridge and to Senator Chandler at this point for signing after the meeting. Okay. Uh, this is our best chance. I don't think I've seen the number 85 uh, in eight years. Mm -hmm. um, I would also add that while the extraordinary relief did come through and the regional district realized about a $40,000 um, extraordinary relief um, successful claim because of the um, higher costs than last year for our special ed services, uh, that will need to be expended, and we definitely have plans for that to be expended by June 30th. The circuit breaker discussion uh, that's been ongoing has not yielded a positive result at this point. Um, the last we knew, there was a bill in front of Governor Baker to sign, and that would have um, restored the percent to somewhere in the 72 percent range, um, but we have not, there's been no decision on that. So those are the two legislative updates for tonight. Okay. So would the transportation um, to get that increase would be would be the similar kind of thing where we'd set up a, a fund? Or this no? would be actually a reimbursement for our transportation, like we get every year. Okay. So it would be directly tied to our appropriation. Okay. Yeah. So we're, I think they're hoping that it settles somewhere around seventy-eight <laughs> percent, uh, but it certainly would be about six to seven percent higher than what we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next item. Oh, do we oh, need a vote on that? Oh. I have a last question. No. Um, on, on the uh, document that you passed out, on the mm -hmm. second page on the back, the one, two, three, four, uh, the fourth bullet down, it talked about um, the ELL calculation, and it said regional district assessments would likely be affected. Do you know in what way that would be affected? It's or it's too soon. Yeah, it's too soon to predict whether that would be an increase or a decrease for us. I think this is a calculation that would factor into the Chapter 70 formula, which is still into consideration because these changes do affect some sort of Chapter 70 increase or decrease. Mm -hmm. um, the regional projection, based on some of their changes right now on the numbers that are going in, is not a significant increase. The increases are ranging somewhere between twelve and thirty, forty thousand dollars for typical districts like ours. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit too uh, premature to assess what that assessment change would be. 
It's great, though, uh, I think, to see that the conversations that are taking place at this level continue to be um, in support of the recommendations, the Chapter 70 um, financial review board that was in place and made several recommendations three or four years ago now. So it's good to see that some of those conversations are continuing and some of those adjustments to the Chapter 70 calculations could yield some benefits to us. But at this point, it's too early to assess what that is. And as we know, this will go back and forth three or four more times before we actually see any changes in our assessments, but it's good to be mindful of it. For example, this transportation is something that we can do now. Right. Um, and um, it, I think Paul was going to mention whether we need to take a vote in support of this. That's exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's my question. Do we need to take a vote to, uh, to agree to sign the letter, or does whoever wants to just sign it? Or? I think we could do both. Uh, we could take a vote in support of this and sign the letter. All right. Well, I'll move that we uh, vote to support sending the letter that the superintendent described, encouraging our legislators to uh, raise the transportation reimbursement rate to 85 percent. Second. Moved by Paul Desmond, second by Paul Butka. Um, any discussion? Yes. Good. It's a great idea. Yeah, we should do this. All right. Um, seeing it <laughs> further, all those in favor of signing this letter? Opposed? And at all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take care of that at the end. Um, the next item is the school choice vote. Um, I would move that we follow the recommendation of the superintendent and <coughs> pass policies and vote not to participate in school choice for the 2018-2019 school year. Okay, moved by Paul. Do I second. Have a second. Second by Paul Desmond. Um, any discussion? Well, I used to chase this a little bit, you know, for, for some number of years, thinking five or six grand, you know, to put one kid in a classroom, it was kind of incremental money without much incremental cost. But I think that we've done a good job, in fact, of chasing some of the other other sources to bring other students into the into the building for the same the same sort of mindset, and yet the the income that we get from it is higher, so much higher, I would suggest. And, and so I'm, I'm no longer an advocate for school choice. Haven't been for a couple of years. I just had to take a moment there. <laughs> Catch my breath. I, had, I actually had an update in the night because I was waiting for the, so how is that going? Um, we actually, uh, our fifth student will be coming in and um, next year. And so that puts the tuition account, which we sort of set aside to increase our world languages um, down the road and wanted to make sure that we had enough money set aside so that we could fund a, a staff position for um, a couple of years before we slowly transition those costs into the operational budget. So with that student um, enrolling, we will have about $80,000 set aside in that tuition revolving account, and we do anticipate taking in a couple more students um, on a half-time basis. So they will be coming in first semester and departing second semester, mm -hmm. um, which I had some concerns about. We talked about um, at length with the high school administration and um, just so enthusiastic uh, to continue this program. Uh, Director of Guidance, Lisa Conry, does an amazing job mm -hmm. moving forward. We've recertified from Homeland Security, which was an interesting process in order for us to continue issuing the, um, the documentation that's necessary to bring these students over for that short period of time. And um, we had a good time doing that uh, more, more times than we would have liked uh, because dealing with Homeland Security and entering into their CVS database is an exciting, exciting challenge. So um, yeah, we're on track. I, next year we might be having the conversation about do we have enough to bring in a part-time teacher for maybe Mandarin and we could probably fund that position without impacting the operational budget for a couple of years. So I think, uh, you know, this is new for Sarah, too, as well, Dr. Walsh, and just been a great collaboration. Awesome. Great. Any other discussion on the school choice? Seeing none. Um, all those in favor of not? Um, I, uh, I'd like to make a motion. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, I would, about school choice, apparently we need special 
uh, wording. Special, mm. language. Yes. Special, language. special language. Special choice, special language. I move that the Northboro Southboro, Southboro Regional School District vote to vote to not participate mm -hmm. in school choice in the FY19 school year and to direct the superintendent to inform the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education no later than June 1st, 2018 of this vote. Okay. Law second that. <laughs> <laughs> and seconded by Paul Bucca. Um, so just to be clear, we're voting for this. That, right, for yes. this motion, that motion not to that, participate. Correct. Yes. yes. Okay. All those in favor of this motion. Okay. That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Um, next is the superintendent's report to the committee. One day I'm going to flip this around just so I'm not following Dr. Walsh's presentation, but not tonight. So. Um, you're up. All right. I'm excited. Okay. So, um, it's then we get to do this tonight and one more time, correct? So I'm, I might go a little longer. I'm going to steal my time. I thought about doing five pages, but I kept it to four. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to do my quick little blurb on our math team. They have continued their stellar performance and their collaboration. Uh, remember, they also work with one of our eighth graders coming up, um, third in class A. We have perfect scores coming from our students. And what's most exciting about our math teams is that they enjoy the competition and spirit of competition. Um, they talk about it. They work together. You see them talking about it at lunch. So I just want to give a, a kudos to them. We had mentioned earlier the collaboration with the middle schools is ongoing, so that's very exciting. It helps the seamless transition from eight to nine. And they're doing it through math, so very, very fun. Um, I'm going to skip down to our music department. They did a three-day tour of New York City. I haven't had the opportunity to experience that tour with them, but um, some elbow jabbing at Ms. Collins, she sent me a video clip of the children, our chorus, singing in the church. Breathtaking. I must have played it for anybody and everybody, just stopping random strangers on the streets, because... It was unbelievable, and I know that we've experienced it when we come in through the rotunda on open house and we hear the children singing. The acoustics of the church and their voices just came together, and so and I would play for you right now, but I know it would be awkward and I'd probably go too long, but <laughs> bar none. And, and speaking of the arts, you'll see me talk about it in a minute. If you get a chance, our art show is going on. We had to reschedule our opening night from last night to this coming Monday. Sneak a peek, I'll unlock it, talk about it. I post a video about that too, very exciting. Um, but that's where you showcase the work from the entire year that all of our children have been working on. It comes to that culminating event for them. They're very excited to speak about it. You can see their work. There's different aspects of work from um, the pottery, from sculpture to different forms of artistic display. So that's up now in case you can't make it Monday um, and tried to come yesterday. So I will open that. If you wanna bring the camera down, we can go down and check that out. Very excited about it. Um, our computer science team, we have a great computer science program here. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to them. They have been plugging away at competitions, stellar competitions. They enjoy what they do. They enjoy programming. We have a, a programming computer class or club after school. So they take it out of the classroom. I don't give them enough accolades because they're just starting. So I wanted to take that moment with only two opportunities to do this before the end of the year to just say super kudos to them. Yes, they're winning, and they're competing uh, all across the state, but more importantly, they're enjoying the work that they do in computer science, and that's where the work becomes very exciting. In our activities and clubs, our robotics team attended the first ever Robotics World Championship, and nationally, they came 27th within their, um, their division of 70 teams. They, if you've ever witnessed them, if you've ever been able to participate, I know that they're having their end of the year gathering, they have so many displays. I don't know how they do what they do, but it's exciting and they explain to me and it makes sense. So that's really exciting too, because if you can teach it, then you know it. So another uh, testament where they're taking their work that they do in the classroom and they're applying it live time. Um, our DECA team, as you've heard me speak about all year, they went to their international competition. We had 28 students. Every single student scored high. Every single student had a stellar performance. So I wanted to give them a shout out. I was gonna talk about HOSA, but Miss Anini, um, definitely upstaged me on that, so I snuck in the picture but wanted to put it in there. If you were here Friday night last week, it was a gorgeous night. We had Relay for Life, hugely successful event here run out of the high school. Um, Mr. Chap puts it on, which is exciting. And I wanted to give a shout out to our freshman steering committee. Here we have a new group of students in Algonquin, 
and they're looking at one of our traditions, which is the Moonlight Dance, a dance that we host towards the end of the year, and they're revamping it because it's had low enrollment. And as everyone is aware of, we've had some really successful social events this year. Winter Ball was a huge success. You're going to hear me speak about Senior Ball. I just want to give a shout out to our freshman class who are presenting an opportunity for children to come, make positive connections with their peers on a summer night, and enjoy this dance. So it's going to be here in the back by the tennis courts if you want to come join. They've got this great staged lighting going on with, I think it's Christmas lights. And oddly enough, I have a random amount of those that I'm going to donate. So if you have Christmas lights, they'd love them. But I just, I think it's really fun to see the freshman class make their mark at Algonquin and revamp a tradition um, and bring new light to it to have all of the students join, every class grade. So even though they're running it, everybody's um, happy to come. Our Harbinger is at it again. They were the, um, voted the online pacemaker award by National Scholastic Press Association. And why I want to point that out is it's one of only 22 other schools nationally that have earned this award. And I know you've heard me speak about them previously. They continue to push um, their work. They continue to collaborate and push their growth. If you've ever had the opportunity to be interviewed by one of their members, they're phenomenal at the work that they do. And then they capture your thoughts and, and recreate them on paper, which is just um, an artistic skill that I don't necessarily own. And I know all of us have had the opportunity to read The Harbinger, so I wanted to give him a shout out. I did want to um, tell Alex Chen, congratulations for being Teahawk for the month, but he is a, he's a busy schedule. But he'll be back for solar discussion, so it's fine. Um, but we have our Teahawks of the month that I definitely highlighted in our principal report. Um, so um, thank you to Mr. Witten. He has brought this back, and he has kept it up, and the kids are excited about it. I attended our captain's breakfast, um, in which they talked about how much they thoroughly enjoyed the time taken to recognize each of our students in the work that they do, both on and off the fields and in and out of the courts and everything that goes on in their day. Um, and they expressed that to Mr. Witten and some of the traditions that they wanted to continue. Uh, shout out to Alex, who was named All-American for track and field. That's quite an honor and, and difficult to earn. And I want to take a moment to talk about our tennis team. If anyone's had the opportunity to um, come and be a part of our sports or view our sports, spectate our sports, to get to and fro the uh, baseball fields, the softball fields, soccer fields, up on the, um, the stadium, you kind of cut through the tennis courts, right? And you're kind of going by. One of the parents reached out to Mr. Witten and myself and said that T-Hawk Nation was in full strength. They were here for the spring season. Um, snow finally melted, which was nice. And every time an athlete was coming from or to the school to go to practice or to a game, they high-fived tennis players. They gave them a shadow. They said, like, great job, back and forth, great comments. That is the culture that we want to foster at Algonquin. From every level, from freshmen, and the parent that reached out to us was a freshman parent, to our seniors, every student felt cherished. Every student felt that their sport was important as they went back and forth through the tennis courts. And it's a testament to the work that Mr. Witten does, and it's just a testament to our community and the support that they offer our children and how fantastic our children are. So I know that that was long-winded, but it just paints the spirit that we have here at Algonquin and truly speaks about the excellence that we have. Um, Grace and Julianne went to Gillette Stadium to um, represent us in, in Women in Sports Day, both phenomenal athletes, and they participate in multiple clubs and activities. Jumping down to um, department updates, shout out for Ms. Burns, our <coughs> World History Department head. She is going to present at the National Council for Social Studies um, National Conference. This just speaks to the excellence of our educators, which you also heard tonight from Mr. Wealthy and Ms. Zanini. She is um, a true pillar to the successes here at Algonquin, and I just wanted to make sure to mention her tonight. For fine arts, I didn't um, want to give my shout outs for some of their upcoming events. You heard me speak about the art event, but I am willing to give you a sneak peek in case you can't come Monday. Pop Snipes coming up. It's only two weeks away. I'm really excited. I've never experienced Pop Night, so I, I can't wait. You can obviously see how excited I am to experience it. Um, and then we have uh, a musical for the spring coming up. We're going to be doing Wegmans on June 7th and 8th, um, and the showings are listed there. Huge um, participation from our student population. We have 61 students that are participating in this, which is a big cast, so we're really excited to have that be a part of it. I'm skipping signs because I was talking about Mr. Wealthy's class, and interestingly enough, I was there the day that they were doing the, um, what was it, Sour Patch Kids? 
wave. And I was like, oh, what's this, bing? And of course, the wave started, and it was fantastic, and it came from the students. So I think I, I didn't want to photobomb it. I'm off to the side. Um, shout out to our, um, to Ms. Rhoda Webb, to all of our ESL teachers. They put on a fantastic community event called International Night here at Algonquin. We had the opportunity to host it. We had 250 families come to the school and attend this event where not only could they familiarize themselves with Algonquin, they received resources, information, ongoing supports, they played games. It's just a great way to, to connect families of different cultures. They had um, a photo booth. I think that's Alex there with the sunglasses, by the way, holding, holding it up. Hold it up in the tower piece of, the photo bomb. Um, but it, it shows that the SWAT team came. The SWAT team came and set up this whole photo booth to support the ESL families and the diversity learning. And it, again, you have another club or sport or activity supporting another community, talking to the culture of Algonquin. Uh, Algonquin Games, I got to experience it. It was this past week. Weather was phenomenal. Our students in, enjoyed it. Um, our high school students came out to the track and created a cheer tunnel for all of our Algonquin athletes that were participating in the Algonquin Games. And thank you to Ms. Allen and the work that Student Support did in putting that together. That was an extremely fun event and the community was there to support us. Our Unified Singing Club sang the national anthem, recorded it, fantastic. Um, I wanted to talk about our Junior Safe Driving event. We revamped that this year in leveraging um, the skills by Ms. Mackey, Ms. Haberman, and um, I'm forgetting someone, Ms. Hodgkins, they worked with their task group and they linked up with the local fire department and police department, created a whole skit using our drama department. Everything was developed by the students and they reenacted the crash scene. They were able to create um, surround sound so the students could hear the conversations and experience what was going on. Timing is priceless. We have the junior prom coming up this Saturday, which we're very excited about. We just had the senior prom, and anything that we can do to educate our children to keep them safe. And the community really came forward on this one and supported us. So wanted to say thank you for that. And on the last page, um, I just wanted to jump to the bottom. I, I really want to take a moment to thank our APTO. They, the support that they give us and the community gives us, I got to experience a teacher appreciation breakfast. Parents, the day before and that day, just continue to bring in treats and different gifts for our teachers and show them how much they appreciate them. The work is hard. I cannot believe that I have to compete with the science department to get here first, but it is a fact. They are here by six o'clock, and, and I think I was driving by one of them like, oh, he got ahead of me today. But they're here, they're here long hours, and the community lets them know how great that they are, and I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for that and for the work the APTO did. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Ms. Johnson and Ms. Steele, they're our senior class advisors. We hosted the senior ball this year at Wachusett. It was a phenomenal event. It was very inclusive. There was a bunch of different activities the students could participate in. They all spoke about how much fun they had. They did their homework for fun on the bus, on the way there, and on the way home. And they, they sang songs. I mean, every part of the event was about being a part of Algonquin. Um, and I know that our junior class advisors, Ms. Flynn and Ms. Arvinian, are thinking about doing it at Wachusett again because it was a happy, healthy, safe, fun event for our children to participate in. And it used some of our local resources. So thank you for that. And um, anybody looking for something to do Saturday night, mm -hmm. we need some volunteers for our junior post-prom party put on by our APTO, which supports safety after the prom. And that is it. Okay. Wow. That's <clears throat> Not, nothing left, no stone left unturned. I do want to tell you the Pops Night is fantastic. I came to it before my kids were in school, and uh, my daughter, when she graduated, I think I went one more year, but then I couldn't get her to come with me the other years, but I'm just going to come anyways if, I, if, I, if I'm back in time from work, but it's it's. Phenomenal. I, I love it. Um, so I, I recommend that to everyone as well. And um, the Wegmans musical, that, that'll that be fun too. So any other, any comments? Okay. Other than in the packet is also the, I think the first time in a while we've seen a complete compilation of senior week activities. Oh, so it's nice to have this included. Yeah. 
um, because we don't always have all of that information in a snapshot. So I thank the high school for providing this. And uh, if this wasn't busy enough, we've got a full week of senior activities <laughs> to experience. <clears throat> I wanted to make one little comment on the Relay for Life. I did, uh, my daughter participated in that, so I got a, a sense of what that was all about, and it really was an impressive event. They had teams of like 10 kids each, and I don't know how many teams there were. It had to be, you know, a dozen or, or 20 or something. And plus a lot of parent participation. They had, they had to, you know, they stayed out all night. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> and they had parents chaperoning, you know, in shifts, I guess, all night. So, and they'll be doing it again for the, for the junior prom, I guess. So it's, you know. Like you said, it's just a great example of the Algonquin spirit on, on the part of the kids as well as the parents. Okay. Um, wonderful, wonderful news to hear. Um, so the next we have is the enrollment. Yes, and all those wonderful kids uh, are experienced here in numbers. So here's our monthly enrollments next year. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, in June, we will be presenting moving forward to next year, prior to October 1's enrollment, 100% of both Southboro and Northboro um, in the number of projections. That's helpful to our towns as they start to build their budgets and consider minimum local contribution amounts. Um, also in the packet uh, is our monthly expenditure report. And this is a critical uh, report that we take a look at uh, probably daily now as we move closer to our year end. So tonight, I would like, um, again, a vote to approve until audited. And the committee a motion. Okay. So do we approve the monthly general fund expenditure report as of April 30th, 2018, until audited? Second. Moved by John Kane, seconded by Paul Butka. Uh, any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. And also, we've been, uh, particularly this year, adding to that um, vote, the statement of revenue review, again, vote to approve until audited from the committee. If I, okay, motion. Move that we approve the Rupert Southport Regional School mm -hmm. District statement of revenue dated April 30th, 2018, until audited. Second. Moved by John King, seconded by Paul Bucker. Any yeah, I have a question on that. Um, sure. The Medicaid reimbursement looks mm -hmm. like we got some money that we weren't expecting. I don't know if Matt, you want to speak to this. We typically get Medicaid reimbursement. We never know how much. Um, it's never reported on this on the regional side. It's always reported on the regional side because again, we're considered a town. We do get Medicaid reimbursement at both the K-8 levels, but it goes directly to our towns. Here at the regional level, we're able to capture those funds in-house. So that's a fluctuating number depending on the services and the number of students who receive those services that are Medicaid eligible. So it's hard to predict. We do um, actually, um, in, in our budgets, carry um, an appropriation amount for the cost of providing those calculations. We have someone uh, outside a contracted services uh, provider to um, work with us to calculate all these these amounts not only for the regional level but also for our two member towns so that's always a a good thing to see right <clears throat> same with the activity fees which are I think all over a hundred percent it's been a, a great year working with the high school not only for activity fees but our parking fees and we're in good shape on our athletic receipts as well which we actually factored into our FY 20 budget uh, 19 budget anticipating these revenues yep. As, since you brought up about the, um, the Medicaid and the, um, the contract, is that like a, uh, how do we, is that a set amount or is it mm -hmm. dependent on how much they bring in? It's a contracted price. Yeah, it's a percentage of the amount of uh, money that gets brought in, so. Okay. Okay, so if they don't bring in, they don't, it, right. there's no base amount we have to no. give them. Yeah, a there is a base, I think there's a base amount and then there might be an overage, but we sign a contract with them okay. for those services. But again, it's also yeah, for the time, right. It's, it's also for North Berlin and South Berlin K-8s. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's statement of revenue. Um, distribution of the approved budget. FY19. You read the board Oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> we had the move and we seconded, and you asked the question. All right. Um, so, all those in favor of the Department of Revenue? Cool. Okay. That's 
unanimous. Okay, so moving on to the um, yeah, distribution of the approved budget. Mm -hmm. And we have discussion on the cafeteria. Yes, thank you. Um, in your stack of papers underneath your envelope is probably um, the cafeteria analysis that um, I've been working on. We talked earlier this year about taking a look at what our um, fees were and our costs were not only in terms of facilities rentals which we're still working on the analysis but also um, at the regional level our um, things like ca cafeteria costs and so what normally happens is if the cafeteria is not does not end up in the black that money is offset any deficit is offset by the appropriated um, any balances left due to efficiencies through the operational year um, at the end of the year. So what that basically means is if the cafeteria account is in the red, then that money has to be offset before moving on to the next fiscal year. And that offset usually is uh, from the operational budget, which means any of funds that are um, um, in the deficit at the cafeteria account then takes away from any money that we can either um, continue to pr uh, provide supply purchases and resource purchases or, um, in fact, turn back to E&D. So it does affect um, our overall funding in terms of our E&D account, but also um, is money that would no longer be available to purchase, you know, prepay special ed costs and those kinds of things. So what we did do um, working with um, the food service director, but uh, the cafeteria manager here at the high school who does a phenomenal job in um, probably one of the more challenging food service um, environments here at the high school uh, because of the number of offerings we have and just you know the fact that it's high school um, we've uh, drawn some assumptions made some assumptions and the assumptions are on the bottom of the document um, and what you have in front of you is an analysis of our FY 2017 actuals um, the good news about the cafeteria account at the high school level is we are revolving forward a positive balance. But what will happen is that positive val balance will quickly um, move into the zero range. And then from that, we've just basically expended all of our revolving account money. Um, so we've based the high school's projections for the end of the year and then assumed no change in FY 2019 in terms of revenue, but of course increasing costs. So at the high school level, they offer um, an interesting meal option, and I've attached a menu that would probably explain it even more so. The full meal is the hot meal, which is defined as everything in the square. Uh, we know that food service in today's age is highly regulated uh, by the federal government, not only in terms of what they consider um, serving size appropriate, but also nutrition. And that, in fact, affects our ability to receive reimbursement from state and federal um, level. And so for full meals, which is basically the hot meal that we're probably all used to um, purchasing when we were in school, you'll see our uh, projected revenues for the end of this year. The optional meals at the high school is anything that's optional in that last column. Um, whether it's the grab-and-go or the hotline or the made-to-order. So the difference between the two basically is two seventy-five or $3. Mm -hmm. and with the high school level, it's very different, difficult to assess participation rates because, as we know, a high school student might buy a two seventy-five meal or the hot lunch and then move over and buy something that's in the grab-and-go option. So it's um, difficult to exact our participation rate. Um, but we have calculated it at about 38% right now at the high school level. Um, we have the optional meals again, which is in the last column. We have a miscellaneous receipts, which is sort of catering that our own cafeteria staff uh, would do. So if we had a professional development opportunity here and we were providing some sort of refreshments for that, we would go to our own cafeteria first and then they would bill us back. So there's some revenue generated from that. We also have the cafe corner, which is the chips and the, the um, sort of more snack food like out of a machine items that our students would purchase and that generates some income. And then you also see what we receive for reimbursement on, on meals. And so our projected revenue, as you see at the end of this year, again, uh, we're out June 25th. So we have about a whole, you know, five weeks left, six weeks left of school. 
So that could shift um, higher or lower. Um, so that is our projected income, and we have revolving account expenditures listed below. Um, our cafe salaries, miscellaneous expense, or things like cleaning, cleaning supplies, paper, paper goods, plastic forks or sporks, I think is the number one option today. Um, those plastic utensils and trays and those kinds of things. We obviously have sales tax, which is flexible um, and based on revenue and then we have and purchases and then we have our cafeteria food expense. So having said all of that and looking at our current um, pricing structure, we would be in the deficit of about $11,000, 10757 at the end of this year. Again, we do have a revolving balance in the cafeteria account, so we're not dipping into appropriation quite yet, but we are dipping into reserves, if you will. So as we move on to FY19 projected, with no change in um, the cost of the meals and no change in the meal structure, our revenue would be at about 423 because we're projecting that our reimbursement rate would um, increase about 3%. There's some footnotes there that indicate that um, historically those reimbursement ranges would range um, anywhere from 3 to 4%, so we went on the low side of our projections. But expenses continue to rise. Our salaries tend to rise at the rate of our contractual obligations, which is about 2%. Um, our cafeteria staff here is not under contract, so we try to stay competitive with what our contractual um, cafeteria workers' rates are. And then, um, again, we have um, increases in, in all of the other expenditure line items. For calculations, we used reasonable cost estimates, um, projected forward about a 5% increase in revenue on the cafe corner, which are those snack machine-like equivalent purchases. The reimbursement rate, again, uh, conservative at 3%. The average participation rate is uh, 528 average meals served per day. That doesn't mean that's the number of kids, you know, purchase, that are purchasing those meals because they could purchase several. So it's about a 38%. And then our, our expense projections, um, again, I use the 2% salary increase and approximately a 10% increase on uh, miscellaneous food costs and taxes. If we increased our meals at a quarter and we stay for 25 cents on both the uh, full meal and the optional meals, um, the cost if a child purchased a meal every day for 180 days would be about $45. I have to share with you that looking historically at the price increases over time, for some strange reason uh, we've gone uh, in 2009, 2004 to 2009, or a five-year differential, we had an increase. And then we went, uh, we had an increase from 2009 to 2012, three years. We have not had an increase in seven years. So we're moving from 2012 to 2019 fiscal year. So um, again, salaries have been increasing 2% a year for the most part, and um, so have all the other increases, costs, so you can see if we make no change in FY 2019, we would have um, a deficit of about $31,000, which would pretty much wipe out any balance, positive balance we had in the revolving account. And then ever after, we're, we're running in the deficit. Um, I will have to say that increasing costs is not just the answer. A participation rate of 38% is low. And so we need to work on other aspects of, uh, of that. Um, really uh, looking and studying at what our meal offerings are and digging a little bit more deeply into that participation number. That concerns me. Um, it, it should be much higher than that. And so we've had this discussion at each of the K-8s. Both of the K-8s have already voted an increase of 25 cents because theirs is a similar projection. And the um, conversations really have gone in the direction of we need to form a study group and um, look at what our meal planning options are for our students and really go back to our students and say, you know, why, what would you like to see? And make sure that we structure things that um, really are, are nutritious, certainly meet the standards, but also um, are things that students want to, to enjoy. Uh, lunch for kids, uh, not only because it's 
20 minutes of time to chat with their friends, but it's, um, it's all about nutrition and it's all about giving them the energy and what they need to continue through their day. So that is something that this analysis, um, uh, doing this uh, in all three districts has really brought to the fore front of our conversation. So we're looking forward to doing that um, good work um, in the next months, several months to follow, and it'll probably go into next year. So um, we do not need a vote tonight, but I did want to put this in front of you because what we would like to see happen is if we are going to see an increased cost here at the high school, we're able to present this information to our communities sooner than later. And um, we do have paperwork in terms of eligibility for reimbursement and things like that that we would want to put before our parents uh, and make a change by July 1. Okay. So um, as far as partici participation rate, I know from my household, I have one that will never buy. Um, sadly, I only have three more weeks to make them lunch. <laughs> um, and my daughter does buy, but a comment that comes out a lot, and from my son that graduated last year, was that the, the time they have to eat mm -hmm. versus the time they have to stand in line, it just sometimes, it's not enough time. Right. You know what I mean? So I don't, you know, I don't know how you make the lines go faster, but I don't, you know, I don't know if there's a way to study that piece of it. Because mm -hmm. maybe your participation rate isn't that high because kids, you know, by the time they get there, they sit down, then they go stand in line for a while and they get back. I mean, you can't really, you know, you're just shoving something in your mouth and walking out the door. Right. You know? That's great. And I think that's an excellent point. So I don't, you know. I heard the same thing from my daughter. She said she can't buy because it takes her too long to get there from wherever she's coming from, and by that time, the line's too long. Mm -hmm. Kathy? So, um, so my feedback about my kids' experience is old, but my other feedback is very current, and that is that, uh, so I had a football player, and he could not, and this isn't our school's fault, this is the federal guidelines, but he mm -hmm. could not get enough food in one lunch to, um, to, to fill him up. So when he did buy, it would be a double lunch. And oh, by the way, another plug for the cookies, because I gotta say, the cookies in this cafeteria are like better than Panera Bread. But anyway. <laughs> um, so, so that also messes up your participation rate, because he's right. buying double, right? And a lot of kids do. And a lot of kids probably do, yeah. if they're buying. So, but the other thing I wanna point out is, once you start, especially if you increase it, and once you start getting a double lunch, plus the cookie, <laughs> um, then you can get a really big, lot of food, healthy meal at Chipotle. And so I was in Chipotle at two o'clock the other day and the line was out the door and it was all Algonquin kids. So I suspect maybe what they're doing is they're just bringing like snacks for lunch and then when school is out, you know, especially if they're an athlete and they have sports to go to afterwards and stuff like that, that's where they're getting their real food. So, you know, if we could do whatever we can do to try to bring those dollars, I mean, it's tough to compete with Chipotle, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it opened concession stands for Chipotle exactly. or something. So right. The other argument would be, too, is that some of these kids are eating at 10.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't, you know, it's an early time to eat lunch, and I know you can't change that because it's a school day, but, you know, they're having breakfast, you know, around quarter of seven, 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 two, whatever it is, and then, you know, three hours later, you know, some kids are hungry, some kids aren't gonna be. Right. And they aren't, you know, like my, I know that one of my kids will go to Chipotle or they'll stop someplace before practice just because if they haven't had that, they'll go from 10.30 mm -hmm. to two, mm -hmm. you know. Kathleen? I have, my daughter is a committed vegetarian and I see very little that she would be willing to eat. And I know a number of high school students that don't wanna participate in buying lunch because of the throwaways. It, from an environmental sensitivity, they just can't bear it. Um, and that has, uh, that's been a pretty consistent theme from folks that I've been meeting of late. When you say throwaways, do you mean the, the containers or do you mean the food? The trays. The trays and stuff. Okay. Keeps coming up. Okay. So just from, from a money point of view, I mean, if, if we do, and, and I guess if we don't vote on it this meeting, you want to vote on it next, right? Because we want to open the school year with it. Mm -hmm. If we go up to 25 cents per, we're still dipping into the mm -hmm. 
-hmm. revolving account by 25 grand almost mm -hmm. versus 36. I mean, you know, how I mean, is that is that enough? Are we gonna? I mean, how do we not be dipping into or you know increasing assessments? You know, by the following year, mm -hmm. if, if all you've got left in the in the revolving account is 30 grand. It may not be. It's a step in the right direction. It's been some time before we, since we've raised the prices. I think the the um, the piece that's essential is that we don't wait um, to have conversations about the revolving accounts because it's not just money here. It's money that really is impactful on, uh, on the budget. And so I think that we raise it. We take a, a, a checkpoint halfway through next year. See where that is. Um, everything that's discussed today, this whole issue is multifaceted. It's right. It's not just about the food. Um, I know the high school is doing, uh, Sarah and I just had a few seconds to chat um, before the meeting, and they've already started to look at the schedule. Um, there are things that can be realized through some schedule changes, so it's very timely to have this conversation as well. We know we've been, we've been talking and discussing what are our scheduling options at the high school. So, um, you know, not sure what what those options might be, but to have that part of the conversation now where we're taking a look at things is, is important. Um, what can be provided to students after school as well so that they're not going down the road. Um, there's a lot of things that have been mentioned tonight that we need to take a look at, not because it's about money, but because it's not it's what we're not doing for our students. Um, you know, whatever we may decide to do may cost more, but then it's about giving students choice and it's about giving them choices that they want to participate in. So I think this, this is not just about a quarter, it's about really examining what we're doing and the practice of what we're delivering, whether it's, you know, what is the cost of the throwaway, that's kind of what was covered in the miscellaneous expense, what does that look like? And to just do a thorough analysis, it's been some time, and the students' um, purchasing patterns, their lifestyle um, changes have occurred since we've looked at this seven years ago. So all of the things that you mentioned this evening are really key and should really be part of a comprehensive study. And uh, we need to talk to our kids. You know, at the, the K um, level, I was chatting with some parents today. We had a site visit and um, parents and teachers. And they were very excited about this. And, you know, I shared with them that their observations for kids at that level are critical uh, to this conversation. What are they hearing and you know what are they what are they observing from kids? Just like you've shared for the high school level, what they are saying to you and the feedback that you're receiving will be important. So um, I, I, I'm excited about the project that we're going to be embracing, and I think um, looking forward to coming back and reporting. You know whether it's you know what all these things that these this is what we have planned we haven't implemented yet but we're here this is where we are financially in January. I think it needs to be more often our, our conversation. And then just one last comment, if I could, if we're going to vote on this next month, and you know we talk about increasing participation. I mean, if we increase participation, does that just mean we're going to lose more money? Or I mean, is it? I mean, have, have, have we kind of run those numbers? It would be nice if we ran those the actual meal before cost. the next meeting to see if participation went up to 50%. You know, we know, I mean, you know, is it is it going to actually make the, the the dip into the revolving account deeper? Mm -hmm. I, I could probably run them before the night's in, and these numbers are embedded in my mind. <laughs> and so, um, well, I think we should vote next month. I mean, I okay. think we should make it public and put it on the agenda, and if Fine. people want to say something, we should give them a chance to. So if there's other information that someone, uh, that any member would like, you know, Paul's talked about doing some scenarios in terms of participation rates, and we would have to do, um, I think, it based on the full and the, and the, um, the optional meal calculations that we use for this and run it equally so. But if there's any other information that you'd like uh, brought back to the table in June, um, if the chair doesn't mind, just send them yeah. through the chair or send them to me and we'll try to get that done so that we can take a educated vote next month. Mm -hmm. Can I ask yep. just a quick question? When you guys did the participation piece of it, did you um, did you guys track it like is it higher in the fall and less in the spring time? I'm just curious to know if like the eighth yep. graders that come up here, you know, like now they can they have a choice. Mm -hmm. Like I know like my kids like the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, I know, like, get this high school. 
when you go through their um, how much they spend. Most of my boys are the stats. Um, but they have so much more of an option. So I'm curious to know if you know, does it is it higher in the fall and it dips, you know. This is average daily participation average, okay. rate. Yeah. And so there was some information that I um, just received that would show you that progression, but this is just average daily participation over um, to the April 30th date extrapolated to the end of the year okay. based on the average meal served. And that's the participation rate. Yeah. Certainly above and beyond all of the discussion about the meals in general, um, the participation rates are costs are going up two percent a year for the custodial staff, and we haven't had an increase in six, seven years. So, I think even a quarter, just mm -hmm. to keep up with that, call it a cost of living, mm -hmm. is certainly appropriate. Then, I would think that we would certainly look at that very strongly uh, next month. At least for one year, and then you take a look at it again next year mm -hmm. with all the changes that get made. What impact did that have on the bottom line, and mm -hmm. how close are we? Is it, uh, have you ever looked at maybe staggering the times the kids can come in? I think at any level, K through 12, there's always uh, a line that comes in, so you don't, you know, there are people at the last of the line that don't have enough time to eat. I know. It's, this is not possible here, but the elementary level at my school, they put half of the good, the kids are going to lunch, they went to recess, half went to recess, half had lunch, and then they changed it around so that more kids could eat, you know, and have a longer period of time instead of the last kid waiting and then he only has like five minutes deep before they all go out to recess. And I didn't know when we look at the schedule or something, is there anything that we can stagger you know, the lunch schedules by a couple minutes just to get it through. Or the other thing is, and I don't know, maybe it's a health issue, is that the food has to be only in the cafeteria. But if the kids mm -hmm. are saying they're not buying the lunches because of the styrofoam trays, I assume that's what you're saying, Kathleen. I mean, is there anything that you could have a prepackaged brown bag lunch that they could pick up at different places? Because I'm thinking kids today, they get together and they're studying together. They're working on a project. They just want to grab something as the grab and go. Hmm. But can you have that at a different place for them? It's not on a tray. It's on a brown paper bag. Have the cookies inside of it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm hearing. Or so just I'm have a bag of cookies. <laughs> cookies you know? I'm just thinking if something, and I know the time element, and kids, yeah, they're, gonna, they're not going to eat, so then they are going to go off. They've got to get something, and, and they're going to go off to a, an establishment and give them money there. I'm just thinking of different ways to get the participation up and to see fit their needs and what they need to do and to get them to eat nutritious. So. Paul? <clears throat> uh, in terms of what we'd like to see, I'd like to know how much we have to raise it to get the deficit to zero. And maybe we need to go up more than 25 cents. Okay. The 25 cents basically gets us to the average of what the other high schools are looking at. And it's just a matter of just keeping <clears throat> pace with them. And right, but I mean, if we're running a deficit, that's not sustainable. Right. I mean, and you don't know that they haven't, they're not going to raise their prices. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're right. behind the curve on we're this one. We're behind the curve already. It's mm -hmm. yep. yeah. still be behind the curve. And it might mean that it, at some future day we do a 50 cent increase. But certainly something that we can announce next month so that parents can plan yeah. appropriately and accordingly over the summer. Right. Did you have any interest? Dr. Johnson, you mentioned a study group. <laughs> on this issue and I was wondering if you would talk more about that. So this is really just something we've started to take, to take a look at. But one of the things that I think we do well is when we find an issue, we come together and sort of explore what the issue really means and how we can address it. And so usually as a study group, uh, the um, school committee provides an opportunity for the superintendent to gather different groups of people together, state various stakeholders, parents, um, teachers, obviously our cafeteria managers will be a big piece of this, students at every level to just, um, you know, try to identify the problems, much like we've done tonight, uh, maybe do some surveys, 
gather a lot of data and a lot of information, um, do some comparative analysis with other school districts, and come together and really dig into the issue. So that's something we want to launch. And I think how it evolves will depend upon the participation of the study group and what we first identify as areas that we want to study in addressing the problem. So certainly, what do others, um, what do other schools do about providing and delivering the product to students? You know, have they gone back to the, probably the lunch ladies we know that were standing behind those steamy, steamy machines that cleaned the dishes and we were using glass plates and so forth? You know, what does that look like in some schools? Or have all of them gone in this direction because it's cost effective? Um, and that was sort of a priority for them, cost effectiveness, as opposed to environmentally conscious. So that's good work to be done. And um, looking forward to bringing the group together. If, I, if we are able to launch it so that we can spend some time in the summer um, chatting about these topics, that's good. I think sometimes we forget that there's, you know, a month and a half in the summer that we could get some traction on some of these issues. Um, but also, you know, everyone's on vacation too. So we'll get something out to the, to the parent community and the school community soon. Was okay. that helpful? It is very helpful. Thank you. Okay. So I guess we'll talk about this next month as well. Could be a <laughs> weekly, a monthly agenda item. Uh, yeah. Well, at least we'll business. hopefully take action of some sort um, or decide not to on um, pricing so that we can get that out um, to everyone mm -hmm. if there's any changes. Uh, and forward to hear more about the study group. Would that end up being like a something that the combined committees <coughs> or would we just do individual committee updates? Well, the topics are shared, you know, um, I think because of the uniqueness of the menu offerings and the concerns that we have by grade span, it might be best researched at some combined level and then discussed at each of the three committees. Okay. And, you know, the revenue projections and the, re and the um, expense projections are different at each level. So. Mm -hmm. I think that might be something we want to keep unique to the three, but certainly come together together for those research discussions. Okay. The next item is the FY17 audit. So every month we vote things until audited, and, and now we have something. <laughs> what it all means. <laughs> so actually, um, both you and, and Paul were the audit subcommittee. subcommittee um, yes. We had a phenomenal meeting with Tom Scanlon, who is our uh, accounting firm, and I think he gave us the green light almost all the way around, but was quick to note, as we have in our meetings, that our E&D balance is low, mm -hmm. and that could be impactful for us as we move forward. Yeah, that's it just kind of underscored what we, you know, did this past year and trying to come up with a policy and uh, in the past, maybe we were able to replenish. Now um, we haven't dipped, dipped in, not able to replenish as much. So um, that's important. We got a, a, a good bond rating um, because of our the fact that we had a policy, mm -hmm. and um, it'll it'll be step to take to achieve achieve it and get there all at once. But so uh, it's good to see it. So Paul, did you have any? No, I mean, it's really one thing I'd say that was during the last couple of years from the audit versus, say, a few years earlier, you know, one of the things that came through loud and clear from the, from the Scanlon and associate guys was how cooperative the team was with them in providing information quickly, accurately, with no delays, no, you know, no, no kind of, you know, requirements for them to go back and kind of pull information mm -hmm. out that's, um, you know, clearly we were interested in it being a very transparent sort of process and function, and uh, it has clearly moved into that space in a, in, in a very nice way. So mm -hmm. everybody involved should be, you know, should get some kudos on that. That was pretty good. I think the other thing that I'd say is, you know, they, uh, they were encouraging you know, what we're trying to do in terms of, um, uh, you know, post-employment, uh, you know, benefit obligations and the like, and they, and they think that what we've, what we've chosen to do seems to make some sense, and, and they were pretty supportive of it. So, so those were all 
pretty good things, I thought, from them. It came, it was, a, it was a nice clean on it. Mm -hmm. No, no, I mean, no real deficiencies of any kind, right? No, and this I think is the earliest we looked at the audit. I mean, generally, it's August, so to yeah. your point, Paul, the deficiency factor definitely has right. yeah, and it improved. Costs you more money too. The longer, the harder it is for them to get the information that gets end up reflected in future mm -hmm. engagement um, contracts proposals. So, you know. Getting that audit done quickly. I mean, it used to be a while years ago. It used to be around this time, mm -hmm. and then it it got to be um, later. So it's it's very good to have it. The one thing that's new that just to point out to members that haven't been on the region or familiar, unlike the K to eight school committees, we have our own finance finances at the town, and so. It reads also like a little different than what you might be used to um, if you were to pick up financial statements from from a, a, a company, a, a for-profit company, or even a nonprofit. Um, they each have little things, but the governmental entity is even um, more different. And um, where some things seem like they're so different, they they appear in more than one place. What I already looked at that statement. I, you know, I don't understand it. Why am I seeing it again? They have sorts of requirements to, um, if it was an accrual-based accounting as opposed to governmental-based, what would it look like? So you have some of those kind of statements. Um, but basically, this is something that we have at the regional level, um, similar to what the towns would get um, that you don't see in the K-8. So, and it'll show you what the changes are to the E&D. That's probably the, the biggest thing, takeaway. And you'll probably, if you look at the post-retirement health number, the liability number kind of like is shocking. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, um, but even that, that's an estimate. Uh, but it is an issue. It, the idea behind the governmental accounting kind of standards boards of, um, of putting that on the financial statements was so that government municipalities and governmental entities would have an idea of what they're looking at when they have these benefits. Um, before it was like they didn't even know. You just pay as you go. So uh, if anyone has any questions, um, you can ask me. I'll do my best or ask the um, ask um, Matt. Um, I can ask him as well. Um, so, however you like to do that. Just for clarification, I believe that we have voted to accept the audit in the past. Yes, yes, we need to do that. So, do I have a motion? Paul? I would move that we accept the Scanlon and Associate uh, <coughs> audit of the North or South Regional School District for the year <coughs> ending June 30th, 2017. Second. 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 Um, Paul Desmond, so motion by Paul Butka, second by Paul Desmond. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. All right. So next we have, from old business, we have the student handbook discussion. This is very quick. Um, yes. The attorney just provided us all the changes in the required legal language. And I'm, this is, I'm just going to do a visual on this. I asked <laughs> Attorney McAvoy to return everything to black so that his red was really the only edits we should consider because it was starting to look like this rainbow. We had blues and reds and greens. So I just handed Sarah the copy. Uh, we managed to log on at Lincoln Street when it arrived in the inbox to present some copies. So, you know, most of it is whatever you see in red is statute language oh. that was oh. updated. Not, so his edits are very small compared to what we've seen in the past, which is great. So um, last month we presented the student handbook. Um, Michelle T. did a great, Tonson and I did a great job. 
and suggested that if you had any edits to send them sort of my way um, and then we would take care of business by moving those forward in the handbook. Did not receive any, but that's okay because we have one more month to look at them. And again, this we would never touch the attorney's language for the most part. Uh, made some changes to the um, Title IX language, the, the bullying statute, just updated them so whatever we are providing to our parents and to our student population is accurate and current. Um, so that's where we are with the handbook. So will that be available online for us to look at? If we, we can send you this month? link yep. Yep. in okay. in, um, in between now and next month. Right. Okay. So we'll be, uh, again, we're about two months ahead of last year, so um, we're in good shape with that. Okay. Any questions? All right. So moving on, we have policy development, um, the second readings of policy. More good news. Um, I, I'm trying to channel you, Sarah, here with the voice term. So um, what we decided, I know, I'm giving you a shout out. Um, so what we have are policies that at the last um, meeting or the last combined meeting, we agreed um, that we would bring back to each individual committee. Uh, these moved, have moved through both K-8s and uh, we've had our second readings to the point where no edits have been made and for all questions answered. So it's before the regional committee tonight for a second read um, for any suggested edits, which really means that at the combined meeting, we could just move this forward with one vote because every subcommittee, every committee, K-8 and region, have had second reads and we can approve them all at the combined meeting in June. Okay. All right, and then if if anyone happens to see something, let me know. Or we can. I know. <laughs> yeah. I think we have one more for the for the year at combined at um, region. Yeah. So this one, if no edits are suggested tonight, then it'll be brought forward in June uh, next month for a vote on all of these policies, which is phenomenal. I think we did a lot of good work on some of these. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the Health and Wellness Committee, too. Health and Wellness, yes. yeah. There's quite a number of them from them. That, um, very um, I love that marching band looks to be a contact sport for the concussions policy. Yeah, it's always been there. It's, yeah. it's uh, in yeah, the yeah. statute. Yeah. Those troubles can be dangerous. One of those tubas sideways could be. <laughs> okay, so um, next is audience sharing. Oh, did anyone have any questions on any or any comments on any of those policies? Before? Okay, have we not seen one? Any audience sharing? Any audience? Anyone? Any member would like to share? Um, so a question about uh, the superintendent's evaluation and just sort of the process uh, as we refine it <laughs> and we look back in past years. Um, so we are thinking that uh, Superintendent Johnson will um, be able to distribute her um, summary evaluation or final evaluation electronically. And then it seems to me that in past years what has been the big uh, stumbling block has been technology, right? So that you know, you you put the document in Google Docs, and then everybody needs to log on into their Northboro Southboro Gmail. No, Northboro Southboro. Yeah, you know, Gmail. Mm -hmm. In order to get at it, and then people who didn't use it, you know, were ready to sit down to do the evaluation, and they couldn't even get in. Is it unreasonable to ask? once it has, like to, to sort of put another due date, which is not to do the evaluation, but just to get in and, and make sure that you can get in because it's a lot easier. <laughs> and I mean, and maybe it's an artificial, but I'm just trying to get to the point where we can increase participation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so if we can get past the technical glitches and not ask you to fill out the whole document, just make sure you can get into it by a certain date, would everybody feel that was reasonable? And I don't know. My password is <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly my point. 
<laughs> so the due date would be get passwords by June 1st. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, that is that is what will probably likely be in the email that comes uh, okay. with the cover letter yeah. for the. Yeah. Are there any other? Uh, is there any other feedback from those of you who did um, evaluations in the past that uh, issues that were frustrating or uh, that may have, you know, created a situation where you didn't have time or inclination to fill, to fill out the evaluation? Okay. I, mean, I think it's, uh, we've improved the process each time. Every year it changes, yeah. yeah. So I'm just and trying it's to. like, you know, I think having things right there the supporting documentation for um, superintendent's goals and you know to <coughs> evaluate it having it right there to be able to reference it in any write-up that you do is a huge help instead of you know so I think we've gotten a lot a lot better um, More as time goes by. Um, but yeah I think that's the getting in is the one that yeah. everyone gets a little nervous about like Ugh. The password, do we get to do our own password? No, but I'll let TJ know. There'll be some calls in email. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if the password was out. You know, you know how you get temporary passwords and then yeah. you get to set your own? He resets them all and then oh. you Just have TJ's them. contact information. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, in the letter. <laughs> yes, yes, that would be good. Because uh, I, I'm able to open up a lot of stuff automatically opens in Google Docs, so I don't know if that would happen again. So it can be an test. adventure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other audience sharing or questions for Kathleen? Okay. The next is distribution of personnel report. In the packet. That's in the packet. Um, communications are at this time. Approval of bills and payrolls. That has folders for us to sign, I'm sure. Agenda items for next month. We have uh, district treasurer's report, the appointment, student handbook as we talked about, school improvement, uh, cafeteria. Cafeteria discussion and pricing. Yeah. Uh, the school improvement plan will be in September. Okay, that's To allow plan. our new principal to have a full year experience all the way through graduation and some time over the summer to work with her leadership teams. Okay. Superintendent's final report and evaluation. That's combined. Oh, it's a combined. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before no. Regent. Uh, that'd be combined before yeah. Regent. So. Um, I did speak with the booster, um, Tom Spitaro, who's uh, working with Jim Forbush. We had a great uh, about three hour meeting the other day and um, did ask that the boosters present a total donation amount so that we can vote and accept. We did talk th about that in September that this is a practice that we wanted to make sure that we <coughs> adhere to each year. Um, also suggested that um, they may want to send a representative to talk about some of the things that uh, we talked about, which was really how can we continue to have an ongoing conversation about our fields and work in partnership to, um, to move that along. Very, They were very excited. Um, and also Mr. Witten will be um, once again, departing from the regional school district. <laughs> so um, I have reached out and suggested that he might want to do um, a final presentation to the committee and um, did not make this packet. But as you know, there was an announcement that uh, Michael Massarino has been appointed athletic director. I would also like uh, Mike to also attend. So um, both uh, folks will be at next month's meeting. Okay, sounds like a busy meeting. I'm also mindful that um, when we have a combined meeting, the, the lights go out at 11. <laughs> so as we know, so I'm um, trying to keep the combined, all of our discussions yeah. with the chairs that, with that in mind. Okay. Good. Okay, so do I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> I move. I move. We adjourn tonight's meeting of the North Coast Central Regional School Committee. Oh, yes. There you go. There you go. I put Kathleen on, on the record. Oh, okay. Kathleen Howland. Oh, oh, oh. Kathleen Howland on the record. So, in the group. Paul Butka, seconded by Kathleen Howland. All those in favor? Yes. 
And I have the letter. All right.